So, I'm Amanda Joy, and you're listening to Radio Shields Northeast, and it's the Wednesday Wellbeing Show. And uh, today, we are absolutely blessed to be talking with James. Um, so, let me tell you about, about James. So, James um, has studied um, philosophy. Um, it, he's studied um, Indian philosophy and comparative religion. He's also um, studied Ayurveda um, as a philosophy and, and as a, a practice of medicine. Um, he's, he's really at the top of his game in terms of yoga, yoga teaching uh, and Pilates as well. And he's had multiple initiations into uh, yogic techniques. He's also done a lot of traveling and um, is, is just massively committed to helping people to have a happier, healthier, um, life. So I'm delighted to have him on the show today and I'm hoping that he's going to come on regularly and share his uh, words of wisdom. So hi James, hey. thank you for coming on hey, today. Amanda. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. So obviously you've been to India and, and studied um, yeah. some philosophy there. What, what was that like? What was life like in India? <laughs> life in India was great. Um, it was very much uh, a spiritual adventure, a pilgrim in, in a sense. Um, I first kind of went, I had started to travel and have quite powerful spiritual experiences. When I was in my teenage years, I spent a, a year in Africa after school before university. And I'd been brought up in a kind of Christian family and that had given me a foundation to, mm. into you know, this concept of something beyond the physical. And I started to have uh, mystical experiences, you could say, in my teenage years. Um, my year in Africa at 18 years old really just changed the direction of my life, uh, having, again, some profound experiences uh, from really getting into the Bible and reading the Psalms and really embracing Christianity at that time. And going to university after my year in, in Africa, I was really kind of confused in many ways as to, I had so many questions, so many mm. metaphysical questions. Mm. And at that stage, I only had Christianity as my framework to yeah. understand. How old were you at that age? So 18, 18, I went to Africa, 19, went to university. I think at that age we all have lots of questions, don't mm. we, about life, about how we want to be, about who we want to become, yeah, and uh, as well as the kind of the spiritual dimension of, of our of our personal growth, mm. and um, yeah, I would imagine that um, it, that Christian framework it is it could it can be quite limiting, can't it? Exactly, yeah, and I'm very grateful for for that because that was my initiation in, in mm. a way of my. Uh, the way I entered into uh, this relationship with the divine. Yeah. But as a philosopher, I had so many metaphysical questions about the nature of reality, the nature of the soul and our relationship to reality and God. And I just found the Christian framework was so limited. Mm. It, it just did not give really any answers to the questions that I had. Mm. And this led me to... Eastern philosophy, Buddhism initially at university, uh, joining the Buddhist society and, and studying um, some of the Buddhist uh, philosophies and also to quantum physics as well. So one of my closest friends at uni was a physicist and he introduced me to books like the Tao of Physics and the Dancing Wuli Masters, wow. which brings in quantum physics, modern physics with Eastern philosophy and combines the two and shows the correlation and actually they they are in a sense talking about something very similar mm. um, and certainly I believe that science and spirituality one day will be one unified mm. uh, topic and whenever and you say yeah, physicist to me I can't help but think about the big bang theory and I just totally had a vision of you sitting around <laughs> being geek boys in front of your computers <laughs> so yeah. I, I, I love the idea of, of, of a time in the future where science mm. meets spirituality mm. because I think I think we've done a lot we've we've made big steps in that direction already Definitely. haven't we yeah. with those particular fields of science mm. yeah um, so so what sort of conversations did you have at university whilst you were 
um, studying the the two different kind of um, views of the world, the spiritual view and, and the kind of more scientific view. What did you kind of discover from that? Well, I think at that age and also reading some more modern spiritual books like Conversations with God and things like that, started to understand this concept of non-duality, i.e. that everything is unified. You know, you have this idea of the unified field theory, that energy is one system and is all, it's just, there is ultimately one energy. Okay. And reality on its most basic level is, is an energy. Uh, and that energy is unified and everything is connected. And we have this idea of non-locality and entanglement, again, coming through in physics, that something in one part of the universe has direct, immediate, instant communication to something the other side of the universe so there is this unification throughout reality um, and so again breaking out of this maybe monotheistic idea there's humans there's god where does nature come into this there's heaven there's hell it's very black and white it's very dualistic starting to understand that actually reality is one one is a unified reality and we are an aspect of that unified reality mm. and we are that unified reality both we are both a um, individual universe a microcosmic uh, expression of the ma uh, macrocosm of the universe and at the same time we are all that exists and it's our consciousness uh, which is the unifying principle that brings us all together. So uh, basically that means everything you see, everything you interact with, whether it be God, whether it be another person, whether it be a tree, whether it be anything in reality is all one expression of one, there's one being, one energy, one consciousness. And so I guess... Though I didn't really understand it at that time, I started to get an, a, a taste for this mm. philosophy of non-duality. Um, and also I think I had to go through, and I've been going through a process of breaking down rigid ideas in that I've, I was inherited from Catholicism and from my, my upbringing. So being introduced to the shadow and embracing the dark side uh, and embracing that we all have a shadow. And then if you reject that, which I think a lot of, say, like Christianity and these kind of religions do, they just focus on the light and the love. But mm. what about the shadow? What about the darkness? What about the other part of us that we have? So getting into things like, you know, uh, uh, heavy metal and things like that, at that age, it just helped me to get out of this kind of love and light syndrome which I think a lot of the light workers <laughs> yeah, have it's just focus yeah. on the love and light but what about what about the shadow what about mm. the darkness uh watching some amazing movies um listen to amazing amazing music and just you know at university meeting some really interesting people and having interesting conversations uh, I also did my first initiation into a yogic breathing practice at 20 Sudha Shankriya, um, which is the technique taught by Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. So he's an Indian saint or teacher. And so around the age of 20, I started to meditate regularly, 2021, um, which really helped to ground me because I was very, after the, the crazy year in Africa, incredible but crazy year, and this very, again, very powerful mystical experience, which blew my mind completely open and I was um, and it it caused a confusion and this need to know more and to understand more and it led me I was quite ungrounded and also I had this other side to me which liked to party and drink and have fun like most 19 year olds do so really getting into a regular meditation practice towards the end of university really helped to ground me uh, and I had I started to find that sort of happy medium where I was just more more grounded, more comfortable in myself, a little bit more steady, starting to mature and grow up a bit. Mm. And really during my time in at university, I knew, I just knew I had to go to India. I couldn't explain why. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd, I'd, 
I'd had this incredible experience in Africa, incredible experience at university, and I had still had all these questions. I just knew I had to go to India. Mm. So after uni, I um, moved home and worked in IT recruitment for my sins, which is you know, sales. <laughs> We've like, all had that kind yeah. of a job, haven't we? Like yeah. worst sales job in the world, but <laughs> it taught me quite a lot of things. It taught me about business, it taught mm. me how to deal with clients and it. All right, so we're still chatting with James um, and um, we were talking before about um, the fact that he, he went out to India for five years, five years in India and a year in China, is that right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, so tell me about your experience in India because I know it had a massive impact on your on your life, on your work, on your belief system, on your, your spirituality, on, on mm. everything that you do in your life really. So um, how, tell us about it. Yeah, absolutely. Well... <laughs> You know, I went out just before I turned 24 and though I'd had some of these spiritual experiences, I was, I was still just a, probably just a normal 23-year-old wanting a, a great experience. And for the first six months, I was in the south of India. Uh, I was traveling. I taught at an NGO um, for village, supporting village women in Bangalore, t- teaching English, which was a great experience, a couple of months. And just having fun and seeing the south of India, which is beautiful. I went to Sri Lanka. And after six months, I went to the north, went to Rishikesh, the north of India, for the first time. And Rishikesh is in the foothills of the Himalayas. It's just north of Delhi. Um, so it's, it's a little bit elevated and it's a little bit cooler than sort of the Delhi sort of area, Rajasthan, the, the more the deserty areas. And the first few weeks in Rishikesh, again, just having fun, hanging out with all the Israelis and some friends and just kind of enjoying ourselves and smoking hashish and, and just just having having fun, really, and uh, having an experience. But there came a point where uh, it, I, I just had enough of that and I moved to, to Ranjula, uh, which is another part of Rishikesh. And I became very focused on my spiritual practice. I started to read a book called I Am That, uh, which is quite a famous spiritual book in India by Nisargadatta Maharaj. And again, it deals with this, these ideas of non-duality. Um, and in Rishikesh, when I, this, in Ramjula, and I was very much focusing on meditation and yoga, I was, became very focused. I was reading this book, I Am That, and it just talks about, again, what we were saying about non-duality, how everything is one energy or connected, which we're starting to understand through physics. And from reading that book, it triggered something in me so powerful and so deep where I was walking around and I just knew heart of heart, with absolute confidence that everything was divine, everything was unified, and I was in bliss. I was in absolute bliss for about four days. And... Again, there was just just feeling it. Um, everything was an expression of source. Everything, and I was source, and we are source, and we are all one. And that, that is an incredibly blissful uh, feeling to experience that. Mm. And then, it's so weird, I ate one of the Indian sweets on the street street food. Uh, it's, it's like a... Like a little mini donut, <laughs> and I got so ill. Oh no! I was like vomiting and, and diarrhea. It was really, oh, really strong. It's like why I've just been having this incredible bliss, <laughs> blissful four days, and I was so violently ill. But actually, the day after, I did um, an initiation into Yogananda's Kriya Yoga. So I did this. Uh, it's kind of like a almost like a secret initiation, and you you go to the the ashram there in Rishikesh and you get initiated into this kriya, which kind of involves some breathing and some some yogic positions. And that, again, was very, very powerful. And I, f- I felt I found my lineage, if you like, mm. through the Yogananda um, Babaji lineage. And again, it was very, very powerful to do that initiation. And I had some very expansive uh, experiences in, in that. And so really, from that time in Rishikesh, uh, I became incredibly focused on spiritual path. So really, though I'd had prior awakenings, if you like, or prior spiritual experiences, that was the time, it was the 
end of 2007 when I was 24 that I became completely dedicated to the spiritual path and became very very focused and that led me to Dharamsala with the Tibetan government in exile and the Dalai Lama and seeing you know it was um, at some of the Dalai Lama's teachings wow. uh, over that Christmas and New Year and I met a, a chap there a Spanish guy who told me about his experiences with astral projection and how he'd learned to leave his body consciously um, and he taught me how to do this. So uh, again, I was just le living, leading a very quiet lifestyle. I was teaching some of the Tibetan monks English and, and I was reading a lot of philosophy uh, and practicing my Kriya Yoga and my other meditation techniques. And I started to practice the, the technique for, for outer body experience, astral projection, which basically involves, it's a very simple technique actually. You, you, do a body relaxation you kind of relax your whole body send your body to sleep but with the intention to stay awake and to stay conscious and what essentially happens is as your body falls asleep you are still awake and i think this is basically what happens when we go to sleep though our mind falls asleep you mm. know in a sense whereas if you manage to stay conscious you actually can separate from your physical body and you can consciously move into the astral realm. So it took me two months of practice and actually it was on the day the Dalai Lama uh, gave a blessing. He took a, a break in between the teachings and he, he did a blessing to the, to the congregation. And it was that evening that I had my first out-of-body experience wow. uh, where I just came out of my body. I was in my, the bedroom and I was just looking at my body and looking around, looking at my hands, just seeing what it felt like. You know, it was the most incredible experience. It was, it's hard to describe just how exciting and blissful it, it is uh, mm. to experience. Um, and I just thought, in that state, I just thought, this is what it's like to be dead. Wow. Like completely massless. You have no mass whatsoever, mm. but you're still completely conscious and... I was like, then my fear of death just went like that. Just death is the most liberating experience yeah. to, to die and to, to, to be not in the physical body because a lot of our pain and challenges and anxieties and suffering are due to being in a physical body and all our trauma is in the physical body. And when we sleep and we, we leave the body, which we all do, we just might not remember, we're going and having these adventures with unicorns and, you know, all these star <laughs> beings and having all these wonderful experiences and going and having lessons and initiations. But then we come back into the physical and we forget, most of us forget what, what we've experienced, that we do obviously retain something of that experience. So really dream travel, even from a young age, from having a, a nightmare, which I used to have as a kid, and I became aware in as a child that I was ha about to have the nightmare and I could mm. actually I learned how to stop my wake myself up mm. from getting to the actual terror bit of the nightmare so that like lucid dreaming lucid dreaming exactly yeah. so that, I, I teach lucid oh, dreaming fantastic. to uh, when people are having really really uh, challenging night sleep um, mm. a lot of people do suffer from night terrors yeah. or, or suffer from um, a different negative sleep patterns where they're not flowing into sleep properly or mm. they can get to sleep well but then they wake up or when they are asleep they're having awful dreams and, and lucid dreaming is a mm. is a really beneficial tool 100%. to help people to have a really beautiful night's uh, sleep absolutely. Um, so so i know a little bit about mm. lucid dreaming i mean dreaming for me is probably the most important guidance system that i have right mm. now it i you know every night i'll uh, remember my dreams and there'll be normally there's some important very important information and I, I do teach seminars on this sometimes it's not not something that I do a lot of but mm. dreaming is there in many ways as, as a guidance system for us so if we can start to remember our dreams mm. we can really assist ourselves and we can start to connect into that timeless realm and we can start to see into our future and we can understand ourselves in a much deeper level. So 
really from those experiences, I, I started to really practice the astral projections and had some some amazing experiences in the dream world, um, initiations and healings and all sorts, just most crazy, uh, wonderful experiences. And uh, it's, um, yeah, so that's a big part of my life. I don't mm-hmm. tend to do those the astral projection much these days because it takes a lot of energy and time and a disturbed night's sleep often and I'm happy to talk about this uh, in more detail on another show but it certainly was a big part of my my time away Um, and then also I think uh, in those that first year and a half I had started to have some Kundalini awakening experiences uh, and it was like an electric shock paralyzing electric shock moving up the spine mm. and so what do you mean by kundalini waking experiences what, what does that mean well it's a good question because i think you know people in the yogic community talk about kundalini and mm. it's like every, assuming everyone knows what kundalini is mm. and i don't think people really understand what kundalini is to be completely honest I th- there's it's described as a an energy the divine feminine shakti energy that resides at the base of the spine and the idea is in the yogic texts that when our parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system are completely balanced the male and female energies within the body it allows the central channel in the spine to open and it awakens this serpentine energy, divine feminine power. Mm. And it zooms up the spine and activates the chakras and then just by magic you're enlightened. Um, so it's an energy there at the, at the root at the root, at the root chakra. It's very much, I think, really very much related to the sexual energy. And in fact, the sexual orgasm is a kundalini expression, a, a, an expression of kundalini a rising of kundalini but there are other types of kundalini awakening kundalini experiences so it's like a movement of energy yeah very powerful starts at the base of the spine yeah, yeah. and it goes up the spine yeah exactly and and, and and powers up all the chakras on its way absolutely and then you have this spiritual awakening yeah but to get yeah. to that you need to have your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system in balance according to the yoga yeah that's that would be, just to get that in balance would be so beneficial for people wouldn't it yeah we're, we're we're pretty much living in fight or flight mode all the time yeah um so it's quite difficult for us to have the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system in balance yeah and really i think spirituality on one level is very simple it's moving out of the sympathetic fight or flight the freeze uh, nervous system where we're always in adrenaline we're always on the go massive release of cortisol into our system it's so bad for us absolutely it's aging it it damages the immune system takes energy from the vital organs from digestion Uh, it it fatigues the body incredibly quickly and really moving into the parasympathetic which is rest repair digest being social being more in the heart uh, connects to mystical experiences so really on one level on a very simple level when we practice yoga meditation spirituality we're releasing the trauma that allows us to spend more time in that heart-centered state of coherence instead of always fight flight you know freeze uh, sympathetic system so yeah just just to go back to kundalini Mm. there's a teacher that that i followed in the past john velo and and he basically says there are three types that we as humans can experience with kundalini experiences the first is the sexual orgasm the second is the one that I was describing, the electric shock up the spine, which is very blissful. But apparently, according to this teacher, when you experience that, spirituality becomes the number one priority in your life. Mm. Nothing is as important as your own spiritual path and journey and healing. Mm. So, you know... Uh, and do you think a lot of us are waking up to that idea of the importance of of spiritual practice or spirituality at the the core or the center of of our lives i think mm. the well-being movement is encouraging is encouraging that but i do think that for a while we lacked that spiritual spirituality yeah. um, within our culture perhaps mm. um and and there just seemed to be um uh, people are revisiting old religions old philosophies people are looking to the east 
for for these kind of more spiritual ways to live because people are recognizing the importance of having that spiritual practice at the core of their their daily life 100 percent, 100 percent, and it's so necessary now um the you know we talk about in biology which was my undergrad that a species evolves under stress we are under stress as a human mm. family and society yeah, massively. and a lot of us are here to assist with this transformation of the planet the healing of the planet the work that you're doing the work that so many people are now doing mm. where we're starting to wake up often through our own trauma and our own challenges and in fact our trauma our challenges our illness our initiation mm. are that allow us to heal ourselves and we become initiated into these practices and modalities so we can then help others and so mm. there's definitely a darker force at work on the planet and has been for many thousands of years um, or you don't necessarily even have to call it a dark force but a, a place of a state of unconsciousness there's mm. an, an unconscious collective energy that's kind of starting to really crumble now mm. um, and we're seeing that in in the infrastructure of the planet and the governments and the hierarchy hierarchical systems because so many people are now beginning to wake up that they are more than just the physical the body that starting to wake up that there is other realms of reality that energy is something real and tangible albeit we can't necessarily see it, but starting to wake up to this greater idea of what it is to be human. And um, it's it's starting to really uh, happen on a global scale. And I think the earlier stages of that are sorting out your health, eating mm -hmm. well, um, practicing yoga, or just going to the gym, getting healthy, because the body is the temple. Yes. And the spirit resides in the body. And... Again, we look at yoga, which is all, which is an is tantric, and tantra is essentially any practice that recognizes that life and energy and matter, nature is sacred, is mm. divine, mm. including the body, and that we don't neglect the body just in favor of the mind or our consciousness. That it's all. Connected. It's all one. It's all one. Mm. And the body, as we evolve the body, we evolve our consciousness. Mm. As we mm. evolve our consciousness, we evolve the body. So the body is the vehicle that allows us actually to often experience uh, higher states of consciousness. So people are beginning to really look at health. And even you see in, in Harrogate, um, where, where we're having this interview where I live, um, you know, on the main high street, there was a closure and Holland Barrett and it's one of the main s central mm -hmm. shops in yeah, town. Yeah. And now you've got this health food shop in the centre of Harrogate, which just shows that people are starting to really wake up at least to it's their health. It's becoming a more central focus, it is. isn't it? Veganism is becoming uh, cool. <laughs> it's yeah. becoming mainstream. I'm <laughs> not that I th I th necessarily yeah, yeah. think veganism is the be all and end all and is, is necessary. But, these different approaches breaking the old are paradigms. Beginning, people are beginning to to see their difficulties and challenges in life as as not just horrible problems that they have to live through. They're seeing them as as opportunities where the unconscious is becoming conscious, exactly. and they're seeing them as opportunities to to learn, to grow, to change things. Uh, and you know, those things can be just going to the gym more often or taking up a yoga class because there's some physical pain or mm. you know eating different food because perhaps you're recognizing the energetic qualities of food or you know simple simple things mm. doesn't have to be a big massive spiritual mm. transformation mm. i think these 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 unconscious things that you know the most the majority of us are dealing with on a daily basis are just the simple things about getting healthier yeah. and uh, taking care of ourselves, little acts of self-care, little acts of kindness towards ourselves mm. so that we can take care of other people. Absolutely, absolutely. And really, the way I see it in the work that we do, there's a, with the centre that where, where I work, and really society now is becoming so stressful mm. and so challenging 
that mm. a lot of people are getting ill, mental yeah. ill, mentally ill, or physical health issues. And again, it's this crisis of health that is forcing people to look at alternative paths. Mm. The system, the pharmaceutical system, the working, you know, the, the working system is becoming so uh, inapt at supporting people. The system that a lot of people live in is failing them. Mm. And so through the trauma, through the crisis they're experiencing, experiencing they're having to look for alternatives mm. and they're finding their healing and their health through these holistic therapies mm. and so it's very much like you are waking up to a whole different reality and again often it is ill through illness people are so caught up in the system so programmed so conditioned through mm. childhood and through culture and that there, people just don't see alternatives. It's like just completely plugged into the matrix. And then illness may occur or some challenge which forces people to then look at alternative solutions. And mm. then it mm. opens up a whole new world. And mm. it's incredibly exciting, albeit can be very challenging and painful initially. Mm. But once people start to really look at, at these alternative therapies and these different ways of living then it's just like a whole new life starts. And mm. it's very exciting when you get on this path. And Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's so. very, very exciting. And uh, here at Radio Shields North East, we, uh, we want to open some doors and some windows and anything else that needs to be open so that you can learn about these different holistic therapies. And, and each Wednesday we do have um, experts in their field coming on and chatting about different types of holistic therapies. And... Um, and it's been absolutely amazing to have James on today um, and um, we're going to invite him back because he's got so much to share and so much to tell us and, and I really feel like he's a great spiritual teacher um, so it's a, it's a real privilege to have him here today and I hope you'll come back absolutely <laughs> we'll yes you thank you for having me to talk yeah, more about fun. yeah talk more about um, yoga and, and Ayurveda as well I really want to talk to you about Ayurveda and, and God so much I want to talk yeah, to you about there's a lot to talk about yeah yeah, yeah so I'd love to have you back so just just a big thank you, thank um, you very much. for coming on today and, and if you are listening and if you're interested and you want to reach out and perhaps even get in touch with James um, he's available at the do you want to say where sure so we, I work at the Yorkshire Centre for Wellbeing in Harrogate um, www.yorkshirewellbeing.co.uk teach uh, daily yoga Pilates classes we have yoga retreats we teach Ayurveda we do seminars on philosophy spirituality so lots of different things going on it's an amazing centre it's got such a beautiful welcomely welcome homely feel about it as well and I know that there's an amazing team of teachers and therapists who all work from there and we're, we're all very blessed in Harrogate to be connected uh, with that centre so uh, definitely worth checking it out and definitely worth checking out the retreats that are on there as well because that's a real opportunity to put some time aside and learn something really valuable that can really help to transform your life so just thank you thank, thank you, you very so much. much for coming on today thank you Amanda